Hansala Machado Borges, Vanessa Turner, Dennis Paras, very warm welcome. Thank you very much for agreeing to discuss in, within this Digital Markets Research Hub, the latest development with Digital Markets Act. And I propose we start our conversation with uh, looking at the recent uh, explanatory workshop, which the commission has organized very helpfully for the key stakeholders. And the first of the series of this workshop was dedicated to uh, Article 6.5, on self-preference, mainly, not exclusively, but mainly. And why don't we start with Dennis, who, who is with the commission. Maybe you can hi uh, highlight to us very briefly the, the motivation and the key objectives, and if you are satisfied with the outcomes, and then we'll revert to, to other topics as well. Thank you, Oles, and thank you for organizing this. Uh, yes, I mean, I'm very happy to start. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, we, we have organized first of hopefully not the last uh, technical workshop on the implementation of the Digital Market Acts on Monday. And, you know, I'm happy to see Vanessa here because she was also one of the panelists. So I'm sure she will also have uh, some views on this. So the main idea behind, by behind this technical workshop is to, to emphasize our intention to involve, you know, everyone and all stakeholders in the implementation of the DMA uh, in order, you know, to get most out of it and, you know, to make sure that, you know, markets in the digital sector, you know, are contestable and as fair as possible, you know. So, you know, for us, these, these technical uh, wor workshops are essentially part of our outreach and part of our the implementation and enforcement work that we are undertaking in the in the commission you know and the idea indeed of these workshops is to have an all inclusive approach as you as you said you know we have we had many stakeholders both in in the room you know physically present but also online because there has been a significant interest in the participation and listening to the to the workshop now, the first workshop was dedicated to a specific topic of uh, self-preferencing and where we also see the added value of, the, of these workshops is, you know, beyond the all-inclusive approach is to have views of the, of the participants on very practical issues and solutions which are being uh, proposed. So, for example, we, we have heard uh, in, the, in the workshop at, at hand number of very practical proposals which have been put forward by different stakeholders on how one could ensure effectively the compliance with article 6.5 which does not mean that necessarily all these proposals and models will always you know be the same but at least you know it puts out into the discussion uh, different uh, different models and allows different stakeholders to express their views on it so in summary we are we are very happy with the, with the way the workshop went i mean there were quite many technical glitches and i have to apologize for that but in terms of substance and the level of discussion and details and the openness of discussion we really think it was very well done and you know i think a number of participants uh, very much welcomed the the format and and the engagement Thank you very much, Dennis, for, for this very brief outline. Let me revert to, to Vanessa, who has participated actively in, in the first workshop. Vanessa, what are your reflections of, of, from, from this event? So to, to my mind, the, the stakeholder workshop was actually a, an excellent kind of starting point to operationalize the DMA, in this case, the, the self-preferencing um, obligation. And um, I hope that it, the, the same process will be continued for, um, for, for other obligations. Um, cause, but I say starting point, because I think, uh, as Dennis said, there were some suggestions put on the table, which were very interesting in terms and quite concrete. Um, and, but we will probably need to drill down a bit further into the details. And obviously that will be for the, for the gatekeeper to do in, for the relevant obligations in the first place. But um, I think because the gatekeepers will have to demonstrate compliance with the obligations that will involve um, continuing the dialogue with, with other parties and kind of doing to borrow a, a antitrust law term, maybe self market testing um, the way that they want to try to implement the, the obligations um, and therefore continuing to talk with business users um, and end users and obviously with the commission, um, assuming the intention is to, to 
properly implement uh, the DMA. So I think it's a very useful exercise, uh, and I hope they we continue it for for further uh, for further obligations. But I think it is a starting point rather than an ending point. Gonzalo, do you want to reflect uh, on uh, some uh, of your kind of primary uh, feedback or, on the event, and maybe more generally on the format when the, the enforcer, before starting such kind of paradigmatic uh, application of such paradigmatic law, invites the participants and try to calibrate the, the, the mechanics of the new instrument, particularly if the, some of its elements, particularly Article 6, are designed to be somehow um, future-proof, let's say. Uh, thank you, Wallace, and thank you very much for the kind invitation to be here. Um, well, I didn't actually attend the workshop on, on, on Monday. I've looked up a few summaries uh, as to how the workshop went. Um, in general, I think it's an essential process, uh, and I think it's, it's, um, uh, it's very uh, useful uh, that the Commission is, is, uh, is uh, um, promoting this kind of discussions with market participants. I think there's a, there's a great degree of, uh, uh, of technicality which needs to be analyzed. Uh, um, regarding self-preferencing uh, itself, on which I'm not an expert, I must say, um, and the fact that I didn't attend the Monday workshop was because I was preparing a webinar on the DSA yesterday, actually. <laughs> so I was uh, running a bit tight on time. Um, but I think there's, there's, there's a few, not, not to confuse the issue, but there's, there's a few interesting upstream issues which have to do with um, determining what the best result from a search process might be for a consumer that's running a search uh, uh, for a given product or service. Um, I mean, the way that the way that search uh, uh, search advertising, uh, 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 whether within a marketplace or on a, on a search engine, uh, uh, works, as far as I know, there's a, there's a uh, and 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 the ranking of results uh, uh, works. There's a, there's a, there's a mixed process by which uh, um, uh, uh, pages uh, uh, pages or, or search results are ranked uh, as a mix of a a uh, a, a, a bidding process. So uh, you can and uh, companies and 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 brands can 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 bid. On certain uh, keywords or terms, whether they include their own brand or not, or some competing brand, um, and uh, the other component, which is actually I think more relevant than than um, or given a greater weight more than the, the the actual price in the auction process, is is the relevance attaching to the keywords or to the terms which are used in the in the in the search, and so um, I, I I I wonder what um, I mean, and going back to Google shopping. Um, from where I think most of the ideas or the or the or the, or the model was was kind of extracted, um, uh, I wonder whether we can say that uh, users are not actually getting the best results um, if uh, um, the most relevant result for a given search is in fact the gatekeeper's own uh, uh, product or service uh, uh, reference. Um, although, of course. Uh, Google shopping was 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 uh, uh, more indirect in 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 uh, in that respect. I also wonder, and, and and this might be something which might be worth looking into, what the evidence is today as to general consumer perspectives on um, the division between paid search results and organic or generic search results. Uh, um, speaking for, for for myself, I've 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 become. Um, I know I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a, a market template in any way, but I've, I've, I've tended to become a bit more suspicious of the paid results. Uh, and and I, I, I tend to browse down into the generic or the organic results, which I'm not paid for, uh, in which the only criteria for ranking is relevance, because I've, I've found that in many cases, uh, those results are more interesting for actually for, for what, what I was looking for. Um, and so, I mean, just, just to, to, to uh, um, launch in, into discussion, this, these, these, these kind of topics, um, I'm not sure how um, a search engine or a marketplace will actually be able to demonstrate compliance with the ban on self-preferencing um, when the, uh, its, its own uh, brand or product or service does not keep coming up uh, uh, systematically um, as as the first results in the in the in the ranking, um, but I mean, I, I, this, is, this is just my 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 general comments on 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 the topic. But this is very actually that was one of the core problems discussed or, or during that uh, you know in, in explanatory or technical workshop. So let me revert uh, to to Dennis probably with a self evident question: um, Why is Article Six Five has been selected as a kind of as a test? How 
we all understand that there is kind of elephant in the room, the Google, Google shopping case, but we also, there was kind of almost consensual agreement in the room that DMA is a new start and thus we have to, we shouldn't somehow draw the direct parallels with ex post competition law. But uh, can you explain the reason why Article 6.5 and then we'll revert maybe uh, to specific provisions of, uh, of Article 6.5 and maybe recitals 51, 52, which have been, you know, which underpin this? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so one of the first things that I think it's very important to clarify here, and Oles, I think you already alluded to it, you know, when we talk about the DMA, you know, we are really talking about, you know, non-competition law tool, right? And I think this is very important to keep in mind. I mean, the way the whole workshop was started was, you know, with the, with the kind of uh, invitation to have a forward-looking approach and not to look in, you know, backwards. I mean, clearly we have some precedence, uh, you know, but the DMA is a new tool which clearly and definitely goes beyond what we have in competition law or, you know, what sometimes is argued, you know, competition law codification, you know, so I don't think, you know, you also refer to the Google Shopping example, you know, yes, indeed, that is one example and one precedent, but I mean, in the DMA context, I think we are talking about, you know, first the different objectives and a different kind of tool, and then also, you know, the solution which has been put forward and which are being considered are different, to, you know, to the to the ones uh, that we we have seen in the, under the competition law precedent. So, from our perspective, you know, this provides for an opportunity to have a really fresh look and think, you know, how contestability and fairness can be ensured, you know, in in the future through through this provision. Why? self-preferencing chosen as a as a first topic because it was an issue which has been discussed a lot where many questions you know have arose when it comes to the practical implementation and how you know effective uh, compliance with the obligation could be ensured you know and the, the technical workshop showed that there are a number of different ideas and models how this this could be ensured and also exactly because of this because we already had quite few examples and models of how people think about the compliance with this provision and we thought it would be good to you know put that out there and have a very wide discussion you know all inclusive discussion between different stakeholders with probably different interests and how they see the solution so i would say this this was you know one of the driving forces why we have decided to to go with article 65 as the topic of uh, the first workshop and in the first panel Vanessa, you have somehow you started your intervention with, with identifying this dilemmatic nature of, of, of self-preference in which uh, has been mentioned by Gonzalo already that on one hand you, you want to, to so we have to design the system where the very nature of algorithm, of such algorithm requires some form of, you know, a bias essentially or some uh, differentiation. It could not be kind of random uh, generic gathering of data because it will it will be exposed to you know to opportunistic conduct by by by, by companies. But on the other hand, we, sh we have to maintain some non-discriminatory objective and all other long catalog of adjectives criteria. So can you elucidate on on, on these aspects of kind of identifying because we, uh, it's a new start, so to say. So it's really important to to be clear at the beginning. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. But before I, I did want to kind of um, actually, again, say what, what Dennis just said in terms of the DMA not being competition law. I think it is a really interesting piece of legislation in that it is not, it may have some competition law roots and some, some principles that are in there, but it is very interesting in that it goes across other types of law, in particular consumer law, uh, and, and makes reference to data protection law as well. It is actually quite important to to note that that provision that ban applies uh, much more broadly than just to 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 search services it also applies to online intermediation services including marketplaces and app stores it also applies to online social networking services video sharing platform services and virtual assistants now each of those will have different challenges 
Um, but maybe one thing that is in common to, to all of those, and I think is an important element of this, this self-preferencing um, prohibition, is that there are, in fact, two elements to it. First of all, the algorithm, the ranking algorithm that you mentioned, and how that has to be uh, in order for compliance to be present to that, for that algorithm it has to be um, neutral, I suppose, it, um, and not biased against gatekeepers' rivals. Um, so that's one, one of the first key elements. But the second element, um, coming at it particularly from the consumer perspective, is not only that that element enough, is not enough in itself, we also need to look at how the information that is then created by that algorithm, how that is displayed or presented to end users. In other words, how the, the gatekeeper um, how what the, the user interface design or the online choice architecture that the gatekeeper uses um, is uh, what that looks like, because that actually um, can have a decisive impact on the choices that end users then make in the real world, as, as Gonzalo uh, mentioned. And the reason for that is that we as human beings have like systematic behavioral biases, which means that uh, we tend to do things that um, uh, uh, may not always seem completely rational. And um, in terms of say, choosing what is best for us. And one of the biases in, in that the self-preferencing is designed to kind of look at is the so-called um, uh, ranking or saliency or prominence bias, which determines where we focus our attention. So to kind of make that a bit more concrete um, rather than, than theoretical, we tend to read from top to bottom and traditionally inform in, information that's at the top is considered more important and therefore we as, as human beings tend to look at the top of a list where you appear on a page if you're offering a particular um, service will be um, important and research has shown that if you're ranked at the top of a list um, on, on a screen you're more likely to be clicked and chosen um, so where you put you position yourself or where you are positioned by the algorithm more to the point actually matters in terms of the interaction with with consumers so I think the bottom line from that is even if the gatekeeper's ranking algorithm doesn't favor its own services, doesn't self-preference, you gatekeeper could still achieve that self-preferencing in, in the way that it presents information to consumers. So it will be absolutely critical how the um, interface design works. Um, and the workshop went through some suggestions for that in terms of how you would visually order results that are created um, uh, in response to a user's search. Like, um, uh, can you use boxes? Can you use maps? What kind of other design techniques could you use or not use? So I think these are going to be really interesting questions um, uh, going forward. And not only um, uh, search engine gatekeepers will have to think about this, but um, as I mentioned at the beginning, also other um, core platform services like marketplaces and app Store. We have mentioned already uh, several times the 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 the, the key the keyword of uh, con consumers, yeah. And this this um, very powerful uh, category or, or end users in the vocabulary of of Digital Markets Act um, can can we uh, if you look at the goals of the DMA. So obviously we all understand that ultimately everything we do should somehow materialize in the benefits or well, well-being of consumers or, or end users. But if you look at the very uh, purpose of the DMA and the very mechanics of the DMA, can we use uh, the experience of consumers as a reliable threshold? And can it, uh, isn't it the case that it can be somehow instrumentalized by gatekeepers themselves who have the best access to their own data and they can interpret them um, you know, in the way which probably more kind of beneficial for the, for themselves. I don't know, maybe it's a, it's a kind of a follow-up question for you, Vanessa, because you represent the biggest consumer organization, most reputable, more, most powerful, perhaps. That's a very good question. I mean, the, I think one of the, the key challenges of the DMA will be the information asymmetry between the gatekeepers who know what they're doing and how they're doing it, um, and the regulator and other third parties who will not have that same level of, of information. So 
um, in order to judge what um, whether gatekeepers are complying with their obligations, I think it will um, be important that gatekeepers in their compliance reports, for example, or otherwise in response to questions from the regulator from the Commission, that there is adequate disclosure of, of gatekeeper processes and importantly testing um, of uh, the disclosure of, of a kind of full disclosure of testing of how different configurations have worked, what impact they're having on consumers. Um, uh, and also that these, these kind of results can be viewed by third parties respecting confidentiality, obviously. But um, there will be um, uh, a need for a disclosure of information into my mind to make sure that we are able to check that the processes behind the results are are in conformity with with the DMA. Gonzalo, if I may ask you, uh, you are a practitioner who uh, you specialize in competition law, exposed competition law, and we all understand uh, how important the power, at least in the legal uh, dimension of, of competition policy and competition enforcement, how important the power of, of legal precedents uh, of cases, uh, because they somehow help us to refine and construct this, you know, the architecture of, of future choices of decision makers. If we look at the main uh, non-compliance decisions, or maybe even at the, at the main designation decisions, from your juristic logic, from your Going, going a bit uh, uh, um, a bit back, uh, I did mean to imply in my, in my previous comment, obviously, that, that the DMA is not a, a, a new model, a new paradigm. It's uh, uh, ex ante regulation uh, uh, applied, uh, although um, um, applied to the, to, to the tech sector and to digital services, uh, um, relevant uh, um, gatekeeping digital services, uh, although, in fact, it does seem a bit um, that it relies on Article 102, um, uh, diagnostics and 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 precedents uh, for its assumptions and conclusions, and and then uh, uh, um, proceeds to bypass the process of Article One or Two precisely to make uh, the entire uh, the entire scope of the legislation more effective and 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 and, and to avoid uh, long drawn uh, long drawn out litigation procedures. Um, how 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 I think. Uh, um, how I think precedence is is uh, is uh, is relevant here. Uh, I think it's. I think the value of precedence has already uh, uh, been essentially incorporated in the design of the obligations in Articles Five and Six, uh, and and, uh, and and Seven. Although with a forward-looking uh, uh, a forward-looking uh, um, uh, scope, um, I think perhaps the 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 point which uh, um, on which precedence. Uh, might be useful and which has perhaps not been incorporated. And this is something I've, I've, I've been thinking about, which has to do with uh, uh, um, the end game of the DMA or, or what, what success would look like. This is actually a topic that we, we, we hosted a, a, an event on the DSA and DMA. Uh, this is not my, my, my comment. Uh, the authorship of the, of the question actually belongs to Philip Malouk from, from, from Meta uh, Facebook. And uh, um, he was part of one of our panels and he was asking uh, at the time, what, what would success under the DMA look like? If this works, uh, what will things look like in each of the core platform services markets in two or three or five or ten years' time? Um, and I think that's 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 relevant, perhaps not in terms of, of antitrust precedent, but of uh, um, uh, ex ante regulation uh, 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 models. Um, typically, in in uh, uh, and I've I've done quite a bit of of, of, of work in uh, um, in. Um, uh, telecoms and in uh, electronic communications regulation, exactly regulation, and typically, uh, what what you're looking for there is to to uh, uh, dilute a a a a a position of of market dominance or, or, or significant market power uh, down to a level where it ceases to exist, which is the signal to the regulator that uh, sufficient uh, alternative competition has been injected uh, into the into that relevant market, uh, and at that time you can remove the exactly obligations. Now the DMA does have uh, uh, an inbuilt review uh, 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 model by which the, uh, the commission will periodically look at the uh, at, at, at the facts um, uh, regarding each each gatekeeper and 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 uh, um, 
uh, and its core platform services to assess whether its initial assessments uh, uh, to designate that gatekeeper is, is, is up to date. Um, but I wonder what what's uh, really what success would look like, uh, and 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 what the uh, um, what the outcome would be. And I think that's relevant also to to determine compliance. Is is the idea to make sure that uh, gatekeepers cease to be gatekeepers, uh, um, or uh, since uh, uh, under the DMA gatekeepers, I mean the the, the status of a gatekeeper is not uh, strictly identified as a. Uh, um, uh, as equivalent to a, to, a, to a dominant position, does it mean that if you get one or two uh, uh, gatekeepers within, uh, you have one additional gatekeeper or you have two additional gatekeepers within three or four years, does that mean that it's succeeded because say you have a lot more competition uh, on, 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 on the market? Um, or would success look like uh, um, um, not having any gatekeepers for a given core platform service? Um, I'm not sure how this applies to, uh, to self-preferencing, uh, but uh, uh, going back to, the, to all this question on, on, on precedence and, and, uh, um, and regulation models, um, I do wonder what, what, what will leave the Commission happy uh, in uh, a few years down the road, uh, which might open the door to perhaps removing some of the gatekeeper status or, uh, um, um, and therefore uh, removing some of these specific obligations from gatekeepers who are about to be designated now. I mean, one thing I would like to say is I don't think from our perspective, you know, and I don't think from anybody's perspective when it comes to ex ante or ex post regulation is, you know, that we want to determine the condition, you know, the condition and who should be winner, you know, of competition in, on the market, right? I, I think it's more about setting the conditions right, right? So to ensure that everybody has a fair chance to, to compete. So if you see that there is a certain behavior on the market, which is engaged in, you know, by companies that have a specific, you know, power in whatever way, you know, whether you call it dominance, whether in this case, you know, it's about the gatekeeper power, which can impact, you know, both the fairness of relations, but also the contestability of the markets in a wider sense. I think, you know, you want to, you want to address those, but that doesn't mean, you know, that your end goal is, uh, sorry, I don't know, let's say we, we designate tomorrow five to 10 gatekeepers you will have only three next year or in two years. I don't think that's the goal, right? The goal is that, you know, business users will have the, you know, fair chance and opportunity and that we as end users, we are not exploited in any way, right? I mean, if I'm thinking about, you know, some data related to obligations in the DMA, I mean, you know, yes, we, as users, we may like certain things that we get, but at the same time, you know, very often we don't know what is behind this, you know, and I think it's important that we address those, right? Sorry, Oles, we, we, we kind of have our own chat. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose my, my, I just revealed a, a, a personal bias uh, on, on market structure and, and how, the, um, how the supply side of a, um, of a, of a given service might, might look uh, and might become more interesting uh, and more competitive. But um, obviously there's a, there's, there's a bit, um, behavioral element uh, also to the, to the DNA, which I, I think uh, um, goes, goes beyond that, yeah. I think also when, when one um, looks at quite a lot of the provisions of the DMA, they are actually looking at how how gatekeepers use their gatekeepers, gatekeeping position to kind of leverage that into other markets um, to the disadvantage of business of, uh, business users because of the, 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 the power, for want of a better word, the gatekeepers have. It's not, not so much to, you know, um, eliminate them as gatekeepers, but it's more of about creating fair chances for, for business users to, to compete um, um, also on, on other markets. I mean, there are some that, that directly do, some of the provisions rather in the DMA do directly relate to the core platform services themselves, but a, a number of them are the interaction between the core platform services and other services offered by business users to end users and, and creating contestable markets um, at that level. Um, to give, I mean, from my perspective, to give consumers genuine choices. And to discipline behaviours, I suppose. Um, perhaps a question for, for you both, um, Dennis and Vanessa. Um, on the uh, on, on, on self-referencing, and if in fact one of the uh, of the conclusions from, from Monday's workshop was that uh, in line with with uh, with recitals 51 and 52 of the regulation um, and Article 65, uh, it's not about the outcome. So it's not so much about the uh, the, the ranking of results from from, from a, uh, a given search or the way that uh, the uh, the online interface kind of 
present the, the, the results, but about the process. Um, won't demonstrating that the process is fair and unbiased by the gatekeeper imply uh, to some extent that the search algorithm or the ranking algorithm uh, um, is kind of uh, um, opened up for the commission to take a look at and, and, and to make sure that the criteria for kind of indexing the results and the information and, and providing access to that information uh, are, are fair criteria, which are not linked to uh, giving prominence specifically to the gatekeeper's own um, branded products or, or, or services. And is that is that possible without kind of uh, uh, um, I know that the, the opening up uh, algorithms is a, is a is a tricky um, is a tricky issue. Um, is, that, is 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 it technically possible for for the commission to to assess without kind of uh, uh, um, sacrificing uh, business secrets uh, to some extent? I mean, again, you know, the commission as enforcer, you know, and I, the DMA and, you know, just as a comparison, because you mentioned it, you know, the DSA also provides for an opportunity for the commission to look uh, to look into and, you know, to ask questions about the principles which are applied in terms of, you know, ranking, which also means, you know, to gain a better understanding of, you know, what are the driving principles and solutions behind the algorithm, which essentially decides on the ranking of, uh, uh, you know, uh, search results. So in that sense, I mean, of course, many of the things we are discussing here today, you know, uh, when, when we are discussing the, the, the practical implementation and enforcement may raise an issue of confidentiality and business secret, but we as an enforcer, we are bound by that, you know, but that doesn't mean we should not be able to look into it because since this is the core, you know, we should be able to look into it, but of course, in full preservance of the of, of the confidentiality and business secrets of the company's concern. Uh, and then of course, you know, to the extent necessary, you know, one should also test that. And again, you know, it's not only about the DMA. Let's have a look at the P2B regulation already. I mean, it already provides, you know, for a rule where there has to be transparency about the ranking parameters. We have guidelines in that regard, you know. So, I mean, it's not that this is an innovative element, you know, it's just that, you know, this is something which is in relation to the gatekeepers, in relation to a specific type of a behavior of that specific type of a company on the, on the market, you know. So, but I would say, of course, I mean, this is at the core that we should be able to look and understand better how, how the whole thing works. I mean, having said that, I mean, you will always have, you know, in, in a way, you know, any ranking will, will have to make, uh, you know, you will have to make certain choices, you know, I mean, in the DMA is, you know, more about the criteria, how to make those choices and not about, you know, randomization uh, in, a in a broad sense. I think the importance of algorithms is explicitly, um, or the commissions having access to algorithms explicitly called out in, um, in Article 21, um, which is one of the powers that given to the commission for, um, in order to carry out its duties under, under the DMA. There, the, the article specifically calls out that the commission may request access to any data and algorithms of undertakings and information about testing, as well as explanations um, of those algorithms. So I think, uh, um, clearly, as, as as Dennis already said, as, um, there will be confidentiality obligations on the Commission there. But I think that underlines the the, the importance of the algorithm and the Commission being able to check that um, it is in compliance with the self preferencing um, prohibition. And what do you? How would obviously we often hear this that the role of data scientists will be decisive in trying to read properly algorithms obviously we don't have this technical knowledge but can we somehow uh, what would be your response to people who say that trying to somehow to outperform gatekeepers who have super strong muscles in shaping the algorithms in feeding algorithms endlessly and trying to somehow um to do reverse engineering in order to to discover the the instances of uh of unfairness um, or non-compliance, let's say more broadly, would be uh, relatively futile because they know thousands in one way how to somehow to, to comply with the letter of law without complying with its essence or purpose, which somehow develops the bridge to Article, article 13. I think when it comes to the implement, you know, overseeing the implementation and enforcement of the DMA, you're perfectly right that, you know, you will, you will need different profiles of people looking into you know different different aspects 
of of the of ensuring that the obligations are effectively complied with and indeed data scientists will be one of those and i don't know if you have seen because you know part of it uh, you know it is also public but in the context of the you know profiles that the commission is looking for in 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 the context of the dsa and dma implementation and enforcement we are also looking for people with you know data scientist uh, background you know just to again have on team even more people that are able to understand better also the 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 technical parts of of the issues that are at hand right now as regards your point you know about you know gatekeepers and you know big companies will always be you know one step ahead of us i i think i would just like to go back to the previous point that i was making you know the commission has the tools at its disposal you know to ask quite the right questions you know you know what are the principles based on which ranking works you know how does the algorithm work so you know we can analyze to a quite level of details you know how all this works and be able to assess and judge you know whether the the compliance with the obligation is effectively ensured you know all this of course in full protection of business confidentiality you know business secrets having said that there is also and i think vanessa already a bit alluded to it you know the obligation of compliance report which will be super important you know in the context of again stakeholders being able to see how essentially a gatekeeper will ensure effective compliance with the obligation because that compliance report will also have to provide certain information about how for example what are the parameters of ranking what are the principles which are being followed and again it's not only about the dma you know those principles or at least you know the transparency of those principles is already clearly embedded in the p2b regulation you know which preceded the dma uh, as such so i mean these principles have been identified as very important and something that you know uh, that has to be particularly carefully looked at and i wouldn't be you know too pessimistic in sense of saying you know they're always one step ahead i think you know we have clear principles we have clear rules we have the powers you know it's just that you know everything has to come together and i think you know the public you know the the the, the compliance reports you know the 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 screen you know like the look into the things also from third parties will be will be very very important you know including you know associate consumer associations like uh, you know vanessa is uh, representing and you know that's why also you know the technical workshop was all about all inclusive approach and getting all the views uh, you know heard this would obviously uh, lead me dennis to a, a, a follow-on question about the exclusivity of the commission because it looks that uh, the dma has is being designed as a very specific uh, game uh, between the commission who has the, the opportunity uh, exclusive opportunity pretty much to interpret the the, the, the fairly vague obligations full of adjectives in a, in a kind of more or less consistent manner but if we have national the national courts um, who would be somehow uh, allowed the same would, would it be somehow I, I'm, I'm less concerned about the integrity and consistency of the rules but would, would it, wouldn't it interfere with the overall long-term agenda of, of, of the commission as as the body representing the interests of the European Union, not, not DigiComp or DigiConnect exclusively, but broad, broaden goals of the DMA. I mean, just to, just to start at the end, maybe, you know, I mean, I I would just like to clarify, and I think you, you, you didn't allude otherwise, this is not about, you know, commission or even DigiConnect or DigiComp, this is really about, you know, you know, let's say, union having in place a legislation which should, you know, address a specific problem and ensure fairness and contestability and you're perfectly right you know we are talking about the regulation which means you know that any private party can go to the national court and you know seek uh, you know uh, you know whatever they would like to seek having said that you know there are certain safeguards and elements in the in the dma itself you know like the amicus curia you know mechanism where we would as a commission of course have a strong interest to intervene in any case where we would feel that you know potentially a case in front of the national court is going in a direction that would in any way 
undermine the harmonized effect of the of the of the DMA, right? So I mean, this is something which I think as a safeguarding mechanism is also already in the regulation one 2003. We have also taken it over in the DSA because we also see that you know this could be a concern there. And of course it could be a concern in the DMA. And you're perfectly right. I think it's very important that we ensure you know that these obligations are applied in a harmonized manner across across the union. Of course, you know, beyond the amicus curia safeguard, any national court where there would have there would be an interpretation question also has the possibility, you know, to, to send a reference for preliminary ruling to, to the court of justice. You know, so you have mechanisms, I think, in place that you know would uh, would uh, ensure. Uh, harmonized application and usually parties to the national proceedings where they see there is a there could be a risk um, for let's say fragmented application they do not shy away of proposing for example the references so because uh, I, I hear some people uh, 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 expressing concern that if the DMA is designed as kind of participatory model where you sit and fine-tune calibrate specific a scope for each specific obligation, particularly when we talk about Article 6, it's not exclusively about the duties, it's about somehow also the, the opportunity to turn a blind eye temporarily, to, to draw the analogy with, with leniency somehow mechanism. And then this a delicate game will be somehow um, polluted by the, you know, by the pathway or the backdoor of, of private enforcement. Uh, um, from purely strategic point of view, not from legal point of view, is it something which which concerns uh, the, the DMA task force, or it's purely a theoretical, hypothetical scenario? Well, I mean, you know, nothing is ever in life fully hypothetical. But I would have, I, I have to say, you know, that in view of how this how this whole uh, I don't so the process and the concepts have been approached is. Indeed, you're perfectly right. You know, you have certain obligations that are susceptible to further specification. And, you know, the technical workshop on Monday shows what does that mean, right? So you have a very, let's say, very clear obligation, which is, you know, one should not self, uh, you know, you know, one should not prefer its own vertically integrated services, for example, in ranking. But I mean, that, you know, in in specific situations can raise uh, qu certain questions, you know, what is the most effective way to ensure compliance you know, with those obligations. And again, when you talk about the participatory, from our perspective, it's very important, you know, that, you know, it's clear, as Vanessa was saying at the beginning, it's on the gatekeepers to ensure the compliance, you know, with these obligations. But then it's also important that you know, we as a commission, we have the possibility to say what we think about this, but even more so that, you know, if the questions arise about the effective compliance, that also third parties have this possibility, right, to say, you know, we as, you know, potential beneficiaries or we as users of this service, we believe that this is not the most effective way, you know, for this and this reason. So, I mean, I, I can see where you, you know, where your theoretical risk is, and I have to say, you know, this is not something that would be on a necessarily on our radar screen, at least not very high. Um, but, you know, I, I also think that there are many elements in the DMA that, you know, will ensure and aim to ensure that all this is done in a harmonized way, but also in a way that, you know, people can actually express their views, what they think about the solution. And then also, you finally, you have a possibility, even where you have a measure in place, which you have considered it may be effective and if it's shown that this is not the case you still have the possibility you know to review that and to come up with the with a solution that will you know provide that will be essentially at the end of the day better and you know better ensure uh, this this compliance so you know many many elements and safeguards in the dma itself that uh, that address you know concern that i think you were alluding to Thank you very much. Before before reverting back to to anti circumvention provisions, I just wanted to ask the uh, opinion of Gonzalo as a uh, as, as a practicing uh, antitrust lawyer. What do you think, Gonzalo? How how uh, how many cases do we have? How litigious uh, the, the first few years will will be from your looking at your crystal ball? Um, that's a very good question. I'm, I'm I'm not sure I can guess. Uh, um... 
obviously I think that, that there will be um, scope for litigation, um, both um, possibly by um, business users of, 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 of core platform services. Uh, um, and also, uh, I think um, by consumer associations, uh, potentially, um, class actions, particularly in, in, in the context of, of private enforcement of competition will have in Portugal been uh, gaining traction. There's, there's, there's been a, a, a trend over the last one or two years for uh, um, more uh, high profile class actions to be brought against, uh, uh, against companies for uh, um, most of them, actually, yeah, most of them, uh, the vast majority of them as follow on actions. So following on from, from uh, uh, confirmed uh, infringement decisions. Um, so I think I, I think it might be more likely for for, for the class action uh, uh, route to uh, to uh, um, uh, take off sooner. Um, I think there's also uh, uh, I mean the whole digital sector and and and, and tech sector are under the uh, under the spotlight. So um, I think it's sufficiently sexy to uh, um, for us to be able to anticipate some degree of litigation. Uh, I'm not sure whether it will explode, and I'm I'm, I'm not sure. Um, as to what grounds uh, and how, how solid grounds might be, for example, to uh, uh, challenge a, a gatekeeper's uh, uh, practices uh, 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 and compliance with any of the specific obligations, Article 5, 6, uh, um, uh, after the Commission has, uh, 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 in its interaction, post-designation with the gatekeepers and already accepted certain forms of uh, uh, implementation as being compliant with what the obligations are looking for. But I, I mean, uh, I think litigation will uh, um, will uh, uh, come through. Uh, um, it might uh, uh, um, uh, take a while. I expect that it probably will uh, um, take the form of class actions uh, um, to, to begin with. Thank you very much. Let us now revert to, to anti-circumvention anti provisions of Article 13. Vanessa, maybe maybe I, I can ask you, 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 you've been very you know, vocal and convincing during the, in the course of the legislative process, trying to emphasize on the power of black or the danger of, of dark patterns and how to somehow to, to make the, the provisions, however wide they are, the or substantive obligations, as effective as possible. Let me ask you if you are satisfied with the current version of the, with the final version of the DMA in terms of, of anti circumvention provisions. And maybe can you elaborate a little bit on the very mechanics of, 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 of this article? Yes, I mean, I think the, um, uh, the Article 13, so the anti circumvention um, provision was significantly strengthened by by the co-legislators during the, the adoption of the DMA. And um, it changed in a number of ways, but one of the one of the key ways was to make um, to make it very clear that any way of trying to avoid complying with the obligations would be caught uh, as a non-compliance point. And, and one of the specific ways from, from the consumer perspective was um, to include um, sp uh, an explicit reference to um, behavioral techniques and interface design. Now, um, uh, I think that is the first time that, an, uh, that a piece of EU legislation explicitly um, makes reference to this, but it, it, it certainly won't be the last time. And the DSA also includes references to, to consumer behavior in it. And, I'm, and, and also the EU is not alone in this. For example, um, California data protection law also raises this issue. So I think it is something that is some, it's very fortunate that it has been included explicitly in, in the DMA um, uh, to, and which will strengthen the, uh, the effect of the DMA. Um, we, we talked earlier about um, the importance of data scientists, but I would add to that as well, the importance of behavioral scientists in order to recognize these, these biases and, and how they can be exploited um, by companies to, to kind of direct um, consumer um, that will be used by companies to 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 direct consumer behavior. So, um, I mean, that's a bit of a roundabout way, but I do think that the the final drafting of Article Thirteen has um, has um, is is uh, is in a better place than 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 where it started, and and makes it more holistic and um, uh, to cover off all possible avenues in an explicit way, not just implicitly, which which um, I think makes it clearer. 
Dennis, are you satisfied with, with the version of the DMA, which somehow uh, is a little bit more uh, wider and maybe more ambitious than the one proposed originally by the Commission of Article 13? I mean, in short, yes, we are satisfied. And a bit longer answer, you know, without dwelling too much, maybe. I think one thing that is important to, to, to recognize is that the initial commission proposal was not fundamentally changed, you know. So all the main pillars, you know, like the definition of core platform services, you know, the self-executing obligations, you know, the anti-circumvention provision, the investigatory and enforcement, all this has been preserved by the co-legislators, right? Having said that, of course, there were, you know, certain elements where, for example, some of the obligations, you know, have been extended, some of the obligations have been added, some of the legal tests, you know, have been strengthened. And, you know, the, the ones that I key, that I have in mind is like, you know, Article 3.5 on the possibility to rebut, you know, or, for example, Article 13 on anti-circumvention, where also, you know, certain new elements were added and, you know, the provision has been strengthened. Or, for example, when we talk about, you know, the possible exemption and suspension, again, you know, the co-legislators further strengthened, you know, these provisions in order, in order to ensure, you know, that the likelihood of any possible circumvention, you know, is, is, is very, very low. So in that sense, yes, I can say, you know, it's good. Uh, we are, you know, we are, I mean, we are satisfied with the DMA as it, as it stands, you know, the fundamental principles and building blocks have been preserved and, you know, certain things have been, let's say, improved, you know, further strengthened, you know, further clarified in the co-legislative process, you know, and that's why, you know, we essentially have this process, so. And if you look, you mentioned this fundamental issue, uh, if you look at the provision, which we all understand the need for such provision, again, because uh, we imagine that gatekeepers would find it way too easy to somehow circumvent and thus to do proactively something which would somehow compromise the, uh, the, the, the essence of the obligations. But if you look at the fundamental part of it, I wonder if, if the formula, which somehow particularly when you look at Article 13.4, where the, 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 the gatekeeper shall not, shall not engage in any behavior that undermines effective compliance. So do we, pre, do we presuppose, again, intent? Uh, or is it just effect, by, or not effect based, but uh, do, do we look at the consequences of the action or do we, do we have to prove or, that it has been intentionally done in order to circumvent the, the substantive nature of Articles 5, 6, 5 7? I mean, I, I would actually depart from that, you know, and in particular, I would depart from this whole notion of intent, which, you know, I think it's very, you know, it's something which, of course, it's very high on the on the burden of proof when it comes to potentially criminal law. But I think, in particular, when it comes to Article 13, I mean, this is not, you know, the core the core principle and the core idea. I think if one wants to, I think it's good to conceive this article in a way as a safeguard to ensure compliance with the obligations which are there and which are self-executing, right? Uh, I mean, and again, it, it's very clear, you know, I mean, gatekeepers, you know, the ones designated have to comply with those obligation, you know, in, in a genuine manner, you know, in a manner that will not in any way undermine those, uh, those obligations or, you know, in any manner that would, you know, as you say, intentionally, but also unintentionally lead to, to, uh, to, uh, to non-compliance. Um, uh, so, you know, I think it's important to see Article 13 as you know, as a provision which aims to cover any uh, shortcuts or attempts, you know, to in any way escape or undermine the compliance with the DMA obligations. And I, again, you know, this is really in a, in a very concise and sh short manner, but I don't think uh, that, you know, we should only be focusing on intent because that could, you know, lead in particular in a digital world, you know, to a situation where some, some situations where, intent may not be that easily to to prove you know to escape uh, to escape our attention and you know essentially allow non-compliance with the obligations i would agree um, with with dennis i don't think that intention is is necessary for article 13 i mean intention may be there um on the part of the gatekeeper but but to my mind what matters is um 
that the obligations of uh, five, six and seven are to quote the DMA fully and effectively complied with. And I think this puts the, the emphasis on, on effects, not how those effects have arisen. And actually, I mean, obviously the DMA is not, as we discussed, competition law, but um, if you look at the abuse of dominance, you don't need an intention for abuse of, um, uh, for to infringe 102, it's the effects or the potential effects that matters. So um, I think I agree with Dennis that, um, uh, the emphasis on, on effects is kind of designed to preclude uh, reading the DMA in some kind of distorted way. And, and there's a clear teleological interpretation that gatekeepers need to implement the obligations to make the objectives of the, of the particular obligation and the DM overall, DMA overall, um, so contestability and fairness, effective. So that's how I read um, Article 13. I, I agree with her. With uh, Dennis and, uh, and, and Vanessa, just uh, um, uh, we, we were talking previously that, um, and regarding self-referencing specifically, that um, compliance is more about the process and showing that the process is unbiased and fair. But I suppose when it comes to anti-circumvention under Article 13, uh, outcome is also very relevant because you want to really be checking whether uh, a gatekeeper has managed to achieve a similar outcome. Uh, uh, which uh, um, is uh, is prohibited by by a different pro by by uh, a process which which on its face seems uh, uh, unbiased, but then uh, reaches an, an outcome which is uh, uh, similar to uh, to what you're trying to uh, to prevent. Um, but I, I I do think that this I think it's the, the the final version of Article 13 is 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 solid, and I'm not sure there would have been any, any other way to make it more precise. Um, um, it needs to rely on uh, uh, open open concepts. To uh, um, um, I am quite uh, curious to see what what practice will will bring up in the in the next few years as to attempted uh, um, attempted circumvention, how that works out, and, and how that's kind of detected and, and and handled by the commission. I think it's going to be very interesting. Before before uh, reverting to the to the to the last part of of, of our conversation. I, I wanted to ask maybe also you, Vanessa uh, and, and Gonzalo, or, or your reflections on private enforcement, because I asked you questions in a role, uh, Dennis, uh, about this matter, but I, I know that you have strong authoritative voices in this in this regard as well, if you wanted to reflect on, on, on the role of private enforcement, collector address in the DMA. Um, yes, I do actually think this is a very interesting topic. Um, uh, and I think, um, well, the the position of, of consumer organisations to bring class actions, uh, to use the term that was used earlier, is actually stronger now, specifically under European law, um, for the DMA than it is for competition law. I mean, there are options under under national competition law, as Gonzalo mentioned, for for class actions to enforce competition law. But the DMA specifically um, during the legislative process had a provision added to it, which will allow it allow the DMA to be enforced by collective actions um, under the representative actions directive. So that's a piece of law that will is due to enter into force in June 2023, so June next year, and is designed to allow not-for-profit entities like consumer associations to bring not only damages actions, but also injunctions to enforce rights under EU legislation, including now um, the DMA. Uh, and if you think about it, many of the obligations on the, the, the gatekeepers have a corresponding right for, for, for end users. Um, it was mentioned earlier, the right to uh, not agree to have your data combined by gatekeepers, for example example, the right to be able to switch um, applications easy, the right to portability of data or the right to terminate um, core platform services, contracts, some um, agreements without um, undue difficulty. So I think there are, there is definitely um, a potential for, for class actions for, for end users to enforce their rights um, under the DMA. Um, though um, coming back again to an earlier theme, I would hope that we, that the majority of, of the well, in the first place, it would be nice to that if the, the DMA was implemented correctly in the first place, but then the majority of the action of the enforcement action, should it be necessary, I think um, probably is, is best organized centrally. But there is this possibility um, as a fallback position to to make sure that, that you know, citizens can also um, um, have a voice in, in the enforcement of the DMA. 
just uh, again one one short comment. I, I I, I very much agree with with your comment just now on the on the fallback nature of or kind of um, safety valve nature of the uh, uh, of the possibility of um, of private enforcement. Um, I do wonder whether in 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 the scope of the topics covered by the DMA, um, and possibly that might be a difficulty for any kind of claimant, whether in the context of a collective redress or class action procedure uh, or a, a, a or an injunction. Um, in addition to evidentiary issues, which might be uh, a bit of a hurdle. Um, I think the the complex and technical nature of some of these matters might be a difficulty. So in, in, in fact, I would say that um, even more so than for competition, I think um, uh, it does make sense to, to, to rely at least on a, on a, um, on a first stage on, on the commission's uh, uh, more uh, uh, thorough and, uh, and experts uh, 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 based on, on on greater expertise on its assessment of on, on whether uh, certain obligations have been complied with or not and have been complied with properly uh, um, and fully uh, or not um, there might be some some margin for uncertainty regarding that after the commission has has uh, uh, um, has looked into uh, um, into each gatekeeper's uh, uh, um, uh, commitments to comply and the way that they're proposing to comply um, but I, I think perhaps the uh, the margin to uh, successfully raise non-compliance might be a bit more difficult in in, in this context than, than in uh, in other fields of law. Um, I'm thinking in Portugal we have a, a supposedly specialized um, competition and regulation court. It's not actually that specialized because um, uh, the rotation of judges since its creation has been uh, really uh, uh, very intense. So uh, um, magistrates are not left in on the job time enough to actually acquire a specialized uh, 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 a specialized view on things. Um, I think with, with, with matters concerning uh, uh, whether algorithms are, are, are fair and unbiased, for example, um, it might be difficult uh, to, to, to bring the case uh, um, uh, before a judge and, 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 and prove the case. But I mean, that's, that's life. It's, uh, it's sometimes more, more difficult, but the, um, the right is there. Uh, and if the conviction is there that there has been uh, either damages uh, worthy of compensation or there is a problem which needs to be addressed by an injunction and hasn't been sufficiently uh, uh, addressed. I mean, I'm sure that the, uh, the, um, the claims and the class actions will appear. I'm just wondering whether the, uh, the, the technical uh, hurdle here might not be uh, a, bit, uh, a bit too high. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. Let us move now to the uh, one of the last topics, um, institutional design, not institutional, uh, but in terms of enforcing the DMA, uh, Dennis, I'll probably start with you. We understand that uh, it's it's a kind of a child of two uh, DGs with its own kind of intellectual pedigree, the vision on the market, which uh, which is not necessarily identical, and obviously, um, how do you uh, can you just elucidate a little bit on 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 the purely mechanical uh, elements of the DMA task force? Uh, just uh, to, to, to bring more clarity about this. Is it still ongoing discussion or it's already settled within the commission? You have the vision um, on these issues, please. Thanks for the question. And, you know, I see Vanessa is smiling. So I'm actually uh, <laughs> would like to hear what, what she has to say about this. But just, I mean, very, very much on this, you know. So the DMA from its let's let's say starts you know is is a joint project you know of uh, of of well at, at the at the at the time it was not only dg connect and dg com but also dg grow right so i think you know it's a joint project which has always been a joint project and we always worked as a you know single joint team you know when you talk about you know different pedigrees and you know different backgrounds of course you know one cannot you know forget that you know dg comp was primarily an enforcement dg and continues to be you know which which dealt with the uh, enforcement of competition rules while you know dg connect is more about you know policy making and you know the, proposing different regulatory instruments having said that you know the way we started this project, you know, continually during the, you know, legislative uh, process and, you know, trialog negotiations, which was always within a joint team, we continue to do, you know, as, as we go along, you know, all the meetings that we have with the stakeholders, the technical workshop, and I'm sure, you know, Vanessa can confirm that has been done, you know, jointly. And, you know, everything is, you know, 
more or less embedded in a single joint team. The only thing is that, you know, when you talk about the DMA task force, it's true that some people physically sit, you know, in one building and some people in some other building, but otherwise, you know, this does work and as, as one seamless team. And, you know, we are proposing, I mean, everything that comes out of the DMA task force is a, is a you know, single proposal. I mean, at the end of the day, it is the commission, right? So it doesn't matter whether it's DG Connect or DG Comp, you know, it's a commission who is the enforcer of the DMA, same way as it was the commission who proposed the DMA as a legislative proposal in the first place, right? I mean, of course, there is some, there are some discussions on, you know, internal reorganizations and all that, but I mean, I don't think this should take away, you know, any focus on the fact that, you know, this is one single joint team. Um, uh, just to, to jump in on that as, as the challenge was put to me. Um, I think first of all, I would point out this is probably actually not the first time that DG Comp and DG Connect have had a kind of shared competence. There was precedent for that um, under telecoms legislation. So it's not a, it's not a unique scenario. Um, but then to come to the main point, yes, I do agree that at, um, with, with you, Dennis, that um, I think the, so from what I've seen, DG Comp and DG Connect are very, very connected. Uh, that's a bad choice of word. But but um, uh, joined up um, in so far in their in, in their um, uh, uh, efforts to engage with the, with the the world on this um, on on the DMA. In fact, my, I think so. There, I don't have a don't have a huge concern on the basis of evidence to date. Where I do have, a, I, mean, I guess, a bigger concern is um, to make sure that whoever has them that there is sufficient resources within the comp within the commission to deal. Um, with uh, the large number of issues that are going to arise inevitably under the under the DMA, we've got it's it's a new law with 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 lots of um, angles to it. So and and we talked about data scientists. I mentioned behavioural economists um, uh, because it is a law that encompasses elements from various different legal areas. I think it is it's and it, it relates to very important. Uh, issues with powerful players it is going to be very important the commission gets adequate resources to be able to 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 do what it needs to do to make the dma success so that that's where i see the biggest challenge and and i hope it's one that that the commission can rise to Dennis, do you want to reflect upon the the resources element no i think i think you know i think it's a very valid point uh, point that you know i think nobody contests and we recognize very much that you know it's it's about the 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 adequate and necessary resources that we need for the enforcement of the dma and dsa you know again the two we always look uh, together i think you know I, I already alluded to that we are in the recruitment process you know of a large of actually quite large scale in in view of the times we are in you know and zero growth and all so i think you know i think we we all agree and understand the 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 point of vanessa and i think we we are in front of this challenge but i think we are also rising up to this challenge which doesn't mean you know as the you know the the, the experience shows if the needs will be higher you know we will also need to see how to how to address those but you know, in the in this initial assumption that we had, you know, in the in the legislative proposal, in particular for the first years, I think you know we are quite at that point already uh, already you know fulfilling the requirements which we have uh, put there. So, but of course, you know, um, we will see as as this goes along. But I think you know, challenge is well understood uh, from from all sides, you know, and uh, everywhere. Dennis, I, I just wanted to use this opportunity, and maybe you mentioned this magic DSA word. In this, again, this in, in terms of compatibility, the DSA is twin, twin brother, twin, twin sister, supposed to be of the DMA, but we also see that there are kind of some, some obvious differences, again, uh, which explains the, the different rationale, and different purposes of, of, these two, of, of these two regulations. But one of the most uh, obvious, or at least prima facie obvious, is that the very large online platforms uh, definition are not, comp it's wider than the gatekeeper's definition. So basically, uh, potential new entrants or uh, competitors for gatekeepers, which would get three years of immunity under, under Article 3 uh, during the, during quali for qualifying as gatekeepers, 
would be subject to very large online platform obligations, or if this scenario is quite plausible again. I wonder if there would there was there were any discussions in trying to synchronize these bo boxes, or, or or it's rather unnecessary in in your view. I think I think one thing that is very important to 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 keep in mind is the the aims and the objectives of the two regulations, right? Uh, on one side, you have Digital Services Act, which aims to address societal challenges that we are facing, right? And you know those societal challenges are in in a way, how do you say that, um, asymmetric, right? So depending on the size, nature, and the reach of a given online platform, you know the risk that uh, that may be associated with the design of the service may be very different and that's why you know in the DSA you have this idea of the asymmetric due diligence obligations which brings us to your question which is you know very large online platforms where indeed the idea was to think in a very similar manner right so someone that is a gatekeeper in terms of you know let's say end users as business users has to fulfill you know specific quantitative thresholds on the other side you have online platforms which if they reach certain size and the size was considered again similarly to the the dma uh, side you know 10 percent of the eu population it does have that size and reach which makes it you know de facto a public space you know where the you know where due diligence obligations uh, are in, in particular important to uh, to achieve the the objective. So in a way, you know, this was uh, synced, right? But that doesn't mean, you know, what you kind of alluded to, you know, that if someone, you know, is relatively newcomer to the market and you know would be immunized from the gatekeeper, you know, situation, which okay, let's. I mean, whether that would be the case, it's something which would need to be um, assessed. But from the perspective of the DSA, you know, one would look into, yes, maybe you are relatively young on the market, but you already have a, such a size and reach that, you know, the, any type of a risk that may arise need to be properly addressed, you know. So it's not about how long you are on the market, but it's about, you know, what type of service you provide, what type of reach you have and what kind of risk are also potentially associated with that. And, you know, that was assumed again at the 10% of the union population. So I think that's important to keep in mind. It's not about, yeah, the, the, the age of the company. And again, you know, we are in the digital world, you know, some of these companies can grow very fast, uh, you know, and have a, ver or they come, you know, from, from a background where they have, you know, where they are part of certain platform ecosystem or something, you know, so I think one should look in a, in a broader scale, I think. Thank you very much. That's, that's quite convincing. And obviously, b before before we turn to the last question, which we have traditionally uh, for all participants, and uh, which would be related to recommendations and advice to those who start this very interesting game as the in the area area career or maybe students graduates. I just didn't want I didn't want to miss the opportunity and ask and ask Gonzalo a question who within which he specializes most. Uh, article 14, we discussed Article 13, maybe we, maybe you can uh, reflect a little bit on Article 14 in, of the DMA in the context of new kind of interpretation of Article 22 of, of EU merger regulation. How compatible these two instruments would be? I know that you deal with these issues, Gonzalo. Um, thanks. Actually, that's, 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 that's been one of my um, main concerns with, with, the, with the, uh, the impacts of the DMA. Um, under Article 14, obviously, uh, um, there's a very wide scope. There's, there's, there's a duty to inform the Commission uh, on a very wide scope of uh, uh, MA transactions, uh, uh, merchant transactions, whether they involve gatekeepers, uh, 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 core platform services, or any other digital service, which, which, is, a, which is a relevant service. So, I mean, it's, it's the, the, the scope, once again, uh, for that duty to inform is a bit wider than the uh, specific obligations, which only apply to gatekeepers uh, um, within the DMA. Um, I, I'm, I'm concerned that, I mean, when you think about the, uh, the Illuminate Rail case and, 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 and decision from, from uh, uh, earlier uh, this year, if I'm not mistaken, um, and the fact that the commission has a certain jurisdiction uh, over a, a merger transaction, which um, was neither covered by any 
uh, member state and national merger control uh, system uh, laws or by the EU merger regulation. So kind of fell into that into that gap. Um, and um, when we take into, into account also the, uh, the kind of revised uh, Article 22 guidelines, um, which uh, I find um, rather surprising because they seem to say that um, the uh, upwards referral mechanism, the so-called Dutch clause, uh, was uh, was uh, originally uh, uh, intended uh, to potentially cover transactions uh, even by countries that did not have their own merger control systems. When the fact is, uh, it's not a majority of reason argument. The Dutch clause was 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 uh, um, thought up uh, um, to uh, uh, fill a gap. Uh, um, um, in, in, in the case of countries that did not have any major control system. So they, they will never be able to assert jurisdiction on, on, on the national level. So when you consider this, this, this trend uh, um, by, by the commission, which I think is quite specific uh, to, the, to, the, to the tech sector in, uh, in, uh, in general, um, and you consider the, the, uh, the revised uh, uh, Article 22 guidelines, I think my main concern going forward is whether this doesn't create um, um, too much uncertainty for uh, uh, um, companies in the uh, uh, in the digital sector and in the tech sector, um, uh, as to whether transactions, M and A transactions, they 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 they, they might want to uh, to go through with, um, might be covered and might be subject. Uh, I mean, to uh, stand still the entire uh, uh, scope of obligations within the EU merger regulation, even though the thresholds are not met. I mean. The whole idea of having thresholds and turnable thresholds uh, within the major regulation was to uh, enhance certainty. In fact, Portugal and I think Spain are the only uh, um, uh, member states which also have an alternative market share threshold, which is always a bit more uh, unclear. Um, but the idea behind the, the, the EU uh, thresholds and, and the community di uh, dimension um, was to enhance certainty. And now we, we have a shift in a, in a totally different uh, and opposite direction, um, which enhances uh, uncertainty. And so, um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm concerned about the impact that this, this might have on um, uh, M&A activity in the tech sector in general uh, in the future, but let's see how, how it pans out. And I mean, Illumina Grey is still to be decided by the ECJ, so. An immediate kind of uh, addendum to, to this reflection is also foreign subsidies regulation, which would also somehow uh, add to the, to the compliance list or obligations list for, 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 for the bigger players, so to say. Dennis, do you want to reflect upon this point or we put it on, on uh, as, as a must for our next conversation? You mean on Article 14 or the foreign... You know, oh, for, probably for, on Article 14, I mean, new reality. What, one thing that I would like to say on Article 14, you know, is that in our view, there is no uncertainty, you know. I mean, Article 14 of the DMAs you know, about the reporting obligation for the gatekeepers, you know. And it's true that in combination with, uh, you know, Article 22 of the EU merger regulation, also in view of, you know, the fact that in the DMA, it is explicitly said that, you know, all the information obtained in the context of the DMA can be used for the purposes of EU merger regulation. It would allow member states to bring certain, you know, transactions that are reported under the DMA, um, you know, to the Commission under Article 22 uh, procedure, uh, but then you know that's that's something which is there irrespective of Article 14 or you know or not. It's just that Article 14 aims to ensure certain transparency when it comes to acquisitions by the gatekeepers. Where one of the concerns which has been identified was lack of such transparency. But you know once the the transaction is not uh, reported then the test of the EU merger regulation applies. So in that sense, you know, the DMA did not change anything in terms of substance uh, of the assessment. Everything still falls very much into the framework of the EU merger regulation. So I would just like, you know, to clarify that, you know, there is no uncertainty about, uh, about uh, this. Do you recollect some proposals during the con uh, legislative process by some top uh, legal scholars that you can somehow amend merger regulation within the DMA uh, the legislative process? Yes, I mean, of course, and I, I know that there were many people having different ideas, you know, but I mean, again, this has not uh, been taken over in the DMA, you know, we, the Commission has always, you know, 
uh, noted and clarified that this is a discussion which should be taking place in the context of the EU merger regulation, you know, so, I mean, point, you know, yes, I agree, you know, all this, I mean, these, these uh, ideas have been brought forward and discussed, uh, but, uh, you know, that's not in the final text of the DMA, let's, let's be clear. Okay, I, 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 I before expressing my most sincere gratitude to, uh, to all participants of our conversation. I just wanted again to use this opportunity and ask uh, for your uh, advice, recommendation, just maybe some steering suggestions for those who are at the early stage of their career. It's obviously very uncertain time, very promising time, very interesting. But if you, if you already, you know, uh, are participant in this game, if you are just a beginner, what qualities in your view, have to be nurtured by, by our students primarily, in addition to those masks which they often get or which you, they usually hear from the, their university lecturers. Maybe Vanessa, we can start with you. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I think um, I may be biased, but I think competition law is a, is a really great area to work in, as will be the DMA, even though it's not competition law. And because one of the reasons I think that is because competition law is so much more than just law. It's a great mixture of like law, economics and policy. And, you know, when we're looking at the type of markets that we're looking at now, um, uh, understanding technology is a, is also very helpful so i guess my um my uh, sort of uh advice would be don't specialize too early make sure you have ideas from all different sectors and maybe maybe on a slightly different point but i've been lucky enough to have looked at competition law or um from several different angles from private practice which is lots of fun as i'm sure gonzalo will say but also as an in-house lawyer as a regulator as well, and, but I'll let Dennis speak to that, um, and now as an NGO. And each of those different career paths can be really interesting. So I would um, say that follow your interests, do what, what motivates you, and if you're not motivated, do something else. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Gonzalo, what would be your recommendation? Um, be patient, be very curious and um, be prepared to have a to be prepared to live with being confused for a while don't get thrown by that um, the eu uh, uh, digital single markets uh, 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 framework is is, is becoming uh, incredibly complex with a lot of uh, regulations covering uh, um, interrelated matters um, um, so i think the entire uh, uh, digital world uh, uh, is, is is very challenging right now, but I think it's a it's a very interesting time. Uh, things things are coming together, moving into Web 3.0, etc. Uh, probably Dennis and Vanessa uh, know, know, know more than I do about that. But I would say, um, be curious and uh, and um, and be patient and try and find strengths in uh, uh, an end user perspective. Uh, um, uh, your contacts with platforms and marketplaces as as as, as uh, consumers as um, any one of us uh, running searches will give you very valuable insights into the, the, the way the, um, the rules should, uh, should work. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. Dennis. Okay, since I'm lost, you know, I will, I will go a bit more philosophical maybe, but I, I think, you know, I, you know, my motto in life is, you know, dream big, work hard, stay focused, you know. So, I mean, in this case, I think, you know, we are really in very exciting times when it comes to regulation. Uh, and I think, you know, the DMA and the DSA, as we always call them, landmark rules, really provide for a very innovative, you know, and interesting way of approaching some of the societal economical issues, you know. And as, as Vanessa said, you know, if you are interested in anything like this, I think, you know, it's an a nice way to to look into to study hard you know to study deep and to think you know what out of those issues may interest you and again you know if nothing then yes you know that's the fact of life and you know you move to something else but i think you know coming from my own personal experience a bit like being a regulator moving to competition law again coming back to a way in sui generis regulator competition law enforcer I would say, you know, it's very exciting times in front of us, very challenging times, 
And I think, you know, one should be proud of being part of this, but also feel responsible of being part of this. So I really, really encourage people to, you know, at least try to familiarize themselves with this. And, you know, if they find it challenging and interesting, you know, by all means, take it up and, you know, we will need uh, good people and, you know, people interested in these issues. And I, 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 I vouch that they are very interesting. Fantastic. Dennis Paras, Vanessa Turner, and Salah Machado Borges, thank you very much indeed for sharing your fantastic ideas with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.